is something the National Park should be looking at controlling uh, in mangrove areas. Um, it does spread in. That's what its leaves look like close up. Uh, um, I, I think is probably one of the best um, things for, to grow fast for replanting is buttonwood, which um, is often a mangrove associate, but it also grows in extremely dry and difficult conditions. Um, those were some I planted since Irma. I have, at this point, 150 seedlings. So <laughs> they're all spoken for already, but I'm gonna keep growing them for a long time. I'm also growing sea grapes, but unfortunately, because, partly because sea grape is popular, as a uh, landscape plant for not just coastally. Uh, at some point in the last 20 years, with sea, sea grapes are, like all landscape plants, are now imported from Miami, which is basically the pest capital of the world. We now have two serious pests on sea grape trees that don't they're not horrible on a mature sea grape, but they affect the young growth. And the worst, that effect, it is a twig borer. And it, it's an insect that lays its eggs in the growing tips of sea grapes. And then the larva, as a little worm, makes its way from wherever it went in um, up to um, the, the toward the tip and then emerges as a weed insect. So, um, growing seedlings is really difficult, <laughs> particularly since it, the, um, the worm is inside the plant and you can't really spray anything, so it is a challenge. There's also a, uh, a sea grape thrips that is now here, and I just discovered that like two months ago on my seedlings that hadn't been recorded as, ha as occurring in the Virgin Islands yet. Uh, okay, moving along, another, another historic picture. Um, one of the other questions people have been asking me a lot is, they're, they're saying there, there are areas where there's just no vegetation left. There's just grass where there used to be trees. One of these stories that really doesn't get communicated about some of the cattle era was here, is basically sugar, sugar was on its way out by the 1830s and property owners shifted over to cattle raising, and it lasted for about 100 years. Uh, in 19, the, I actually have, I think it was the only time it was done, um, but I have a cattle census of St. John in 1936, which is <laughs> very interesting, dude. But they were 1,400 head of cattle on the island when the human population was only eight. And in this, you can see some of the big cleared areas, Mary Point, on its south-facing slope there, Coral Bay, um, and some around Cruise Bay and the area around Pascari, um, but by that time in the 30s were that. But this is a state Carolina with two things happening <laughs> to prevent vegetation. <laughs> this is, the photo was taken um, in 1918, so two years after uh, the devastating 1916 hurricane, but this is Will Marsh's cattle operation that, um, it was big. <laughs> so, um, and the valley, the trees did grow back pretty fast on the valley floor because it's ideal once it was abandoned. Um, but the slope there going up by Constanza Road, as you can see, was um, totally denuded and it's still now after after Irma, it's pretty denuded again because most of most of what came in on abandoned cattle land were two non-native plants that are ubiquitous still on the island. This is Lucena leucocephala, the common name's Tantan or wild tamarind. It's a native of Guatemala that was introduced all over the world as a cattle forage plant and it is very much tied to our cattle history. And where you see it today is mainly on roadsides where the land's disturbed, but if you see it inland or on slopes, it means the area has been cleared. It could have been two years ago or it could have been 60 or 70 years ago. 
and guinea grass. Guinea grass is the, was the preferred forage for grass that was introduced from, from Guinea in Africa for the, the cattle industry, as it were. Um, a few areas, like Hen, this is Henley Key off Keneal, um, with the end of Congo in the background. Henley Key was almost grown over in woody plants again after a um, what, 80 years since it had been cleared, um, the last time for, for, in this case, goats. Um, but it's gone right back to Guinea grass. Uh, Lavango, you, um, I think Lavango had, what, 80 cows on it up until the 1950s. So that's, uh, that's gone right back to grass because it's all early secondary vegetation. And there is Mary, a close-up of Mary Point in 1947. Uh, and Mary Point today, where um, it is all tan tan and guinea grass, except for those green areas where there's trees. And it, there's, in fact, a lot of guinea grass there. So now we get to mangroves. Um, <laughs> this is one of the more visible areas because it was so big, uh, an inland area of red mangroves there on the road um, by, from Mary Creek going to Annaberg there. And mangroves, we saw this with previous hurricanes to some degree, but not this dramatically. Mangroves apparently are specifically adapted to be killed by hurricanes. <laughs> And in the natural system, that's probably not a bad thing. But particularly tall red mangroves get knocked over. Red mangroves, which most of this area was, and all the fringing mangroves of Hurricane Hole also are reds. Red mangroves are peculiar in that when they're very young, when they're seedlings, they can be damaged and re-sprout. But once they get a woody trunk, they no longer have the ability to regenerate. They don't have what are called meristems, which are points that growth can occur from. And that is pretty well documented. Why white mangroves and black mangroves are quite as heavily affected is a little more. <laughs> but it's, it's a mess out there. It will be for a while. But in the natural system, that total die-off is followed by a huge flush of new seedlings. These are red mangrove seedlings uh, in the water, uh, Mary Creek, and healthy. Unfortunately, we do have a new creature in the mix here on St. John. Um, really, since our last damaging hurricane, since 1995, our white-tailed deer population has exploded. Deer really like mangrove seedlings. <laughs> so it's a matter of pretty big concern what's happening out there. I'm monitoring the ones by Annaberg very closely. So far, the deer are only eating the ones on the roadsides um, or in close. They're not going into the flooded area there. But um, they, this is something we've been looking at for several years now. So that, there they are in the mangrove. <laughs> and these guys also, although they're not, um, they're, they really prefer guinea grass to anything else. But <laughs> they'll, leave, they'll leave mangrove seedlings if they're there. There's been also a lot of talk recently about whether people should be getting water to donkeys. Um, this is something totally undocumented, but I happened to be there. This was two years ago during the drought. Donkeys seem to be quite happy drinking salt water. This is Mary Creek, and there they were. <laughs> so all three of them slurping it up. So, <laughs> something else to notice out in the um, Annenberg mangrove area is another tree that is linked to being well, it's definitely part of its system to be killed off by hurricanes and regenerate in numbers is the dreaded Manchineel tree. <laughs> there, there are two seedlings in this picture. The 
one on the left is manchineal, the one on the right is pond apple, which is a freshwater uh, wetland indicator tree. And both of these have thousands and thousands of seedlings. And the donkeys and deer are not eating them, either one of them. They manchineal for obvious reasons. But there is a dead manchineal tree and all of the large manchineal trees along that stretch. And they were a lot of them because those had all grown after Hurricane Hugo in Maryland. When there had only been one manchineal tree there and then there were about ten. And now, now there's <laughs> that many seedlings. <laughs> that, that's like the whole seaward stretch there is manchineal seedlings. This is not a mansion hill, this is pond apple, because uh, people may not know what that is. It's actually a relative of uh, sugar apples and sour stops. It's native and uh, it's, um, it is, a, as I said, a freshwater indicator. This is really interesting. This is a red mangrove, and this was taken last week, and it's fine. Um, it's, it's on the shore there. It, I was thinking, is that more protected? Was it blocked from the west? No, not really. What apparently, from what I can figure out, it has to do with stature. It was short. <laughs> and probably during the worst of the wind, the storm surge was high enough that a lot of that actually was underwater and was damaged much less than it would have been otherwise. That's the same mangrove taken last year, so it's, uh, yeah. But across the creek from there, all of the fringing mangroves along Mary Point you see are totally dead. So, um, and that's actually an east face, not a west face, so it doesn't always make sense. And this is Mary Point Pond, um, the most popular birding spot on St. John, taken yesterday, and amazingly, that side of the pond, even though water Huge amounts of seawater washed through there and into the pond, because you can see the debris line on the landward side of the pond when you look around there. Those mangroves, white mang those are all white mangroves, and they're actually almost perfect. The boardwalk out there was demolished by the waves, but the trees are fine on that side facing east, but the west facing side, um, that's a horrible picture, but the west facing side, the mangroves look like that. It's so now the real forest, and this is, these are the places that I've had a hard time for both physically and mentally with looking at. Um, I went out a couple of times without a camera and digested some <laughs> thoughts about that. This is at the top of the uh, Cinnamon Bay watershed. Cinnamon Bay is actually an important place be looking at it because it's this, the Cinnamon Bay watershed is the site of the longest forest research project that ever happened on St. John, uh, run out of Puerto Rico. Uh, scientists named Pete Weaver studied scattered plots within Cinnamon Bay for, um, for 20 years and recorded growth data. Now, we, we know that corals, for instance, grow really slowly. Do you have any idea how slowly our trees grow? <laughs> just as slowly, under ordinary circumstances. Pete looked over 20 years at 63 tree species in the Cinnamon Bay watershed, and the average annual increase in trunk diameter, they measured everything over four inches, um, I mean not, four centimeters at breast height, um, within his 16 separate plots. The average annual increase was 0 0.7 centimeters meaning seven-tenths of a millimeter every year in trunk diameter. And this is across the board average on 63 species, including some of our fastest growing softwoods like turpentine and um, poop. So presumably a hurricane event like this will speed things up as it may speed up coral growth as well and damage um, and recruitment. There are large areas of the forest like this where the wind just exploded up the guts and near the, the ridge line um, where the winds were strongest, it, um, you know, there's not much left standing. But this is actually taken from exactly the same place as those previous two photos. That's just looking at the slope that faced east into <laughs> Cinnamon Bay. So uh, it was very much the luck of the draw.
Regrowth on most things that aren't mangroves is pretty vigorous once the trees uh, are healthy enough to grow back at all. What happened, really the, the, not just the force of the wind pushing things down, but the fact that the, the wind really wasn't constant over that time. It would let up and trees would come back to their vertical position and then be pushed over again and again. So the bark actually separated from trees. That, the things you see that are dead standing in the forest, it is almost always because of the bark damage. But for a while there in the winter, things were covered with a blanket of green. <laughs> these, these vines, particularly that last one, this is this is ordinarily almost invisible in our landscapes. It's uh, in the millen family. Uh, it's called uh, a millen leaf vine. It's Paeponia. Um, it doesn't have an edible fruit. It has a little berry that looks like those little red things on the ground are the seeds that are going to sit there and wait for the next hurricane. <laughs> seeds are really, really interesting and nobody's ever studied them in our, uh, our area at all. But we do know in places more suitable for long-term preservation, well first, first they germinated a 2,000 year old date palm in, uh, from Egypt from a tomb. And then a couple of years ago, they germinated a 32,000-year-old seed from the Arctic, a uh, Sanlini up there. That was so under. Oh, oh, some seeds also lose their viability within three weeks. So, <laughs> but a lot of the things that came up after the hurricane have been seeds that have been waiting for a blast of sun accompanied by a lot of water. Papayas. <laughs> yeah. Papayas are a big one. They are fast growing. They are originally from the mainland of tropical America where there's species of light gaps in moist forest. And uh, they don't, as anyone knows who's had a papaya tree, they grow up to full size in a year and they don't really have wood. They have a spongy. Oh, yeah. There are other things, um, the, these two plants are both in the Solanum family that is, um, includes tomatoes and eggplants. The one on the, the right is what's often called wild eggplant um, and this is, it's spiny and I, I must have pulled at least 500 of them out of my yard so far and I'm waiting for a good soaking rain to get another 500 of them. <laughs> Incredibly prolific. And something that looks like a papaya, obviously this is a, uh, a great leaf shape to have if you're going to grow fast. This is what people here call a trumpet tree. It's a tree of moisture forest, gets tall, has silvery undersides on the leaves. It's um, confined here mostly to Bordeaux and the uplands, but um, Again, this is coming up all over my yard, and in fact, all over the front line. Before we had that nor'easter um, back uh, whenever that was, a month ago, I had trumpet trees coming up all along the vegetation line on the beach. <laughs> and for me, some surprises. I was kind of waiting to see what was going to show up in my yard from recently introduced trees that might have seeds that would germinate. Um, what I again have hundreds of are langalang trees <laughs> from which are very prized for their perfume. It's a little bit overwhelming actually, but uh, my sister-in-law has a tall one that has been fruiting and the birds and bats obviously have spread those seeds not just in my yard, but way up on the hillsides. But I don't think they're going to survive through uh, the, even this dry season, but certainly a hard drought. Okay. And then there are other surprises. This little thing, it's very nondescript, it's very small. This is a plant that appeared in my yard. There's six of them. It's a ground cover leaf really thing. It's native in Puerto Rico, Calabria, and St. Croix but it's never been collected or recorded as occurring in the Northern Virgin Islands. <laughs> Had those seeds been there for 
the last 80 years or something, and another one, sweet leaf, yerba dulce. Um, this is cultivated, it's very similar to stevia, it has extremely sweet foliage, they're really quite good. <laughs> and I found that actually yesterday in my yard, and I have never seen it before in my life. I knew what it was um, because it's similar to relatives of it. The other thing that's happened that's hard to deal with is losing some of our giants, our oldest trees. This is a tree that was always very hard to photograph. Um, it's in my yard, it's a tropical almond, which is not native to the West Indies, it comes from the East Indies. The younger ones did really well in Irma, but this one was already that size probably a hundred years ago, and it had some rot at the bottom. But here's side by side, this is the view out my bedroom window <laughs> on the east side with it and without it. <laughs> the, the trunk at the base had a uh, circumference of 25 feet. Yeah. And that, that piece of wood sticking up on the right hand side there is part, it's not the, the stump, it's part of the broken trunk. It's about a, maybe an eighth of the broken trunk. This beautiful tamarind tree on the, uh, the trail from Lancashire to Reef Bay, um, I actually have not gone out there, but I've heard reports that that's, this was the largest tamarind tree in the Virgin Islands. Uh, it was hollow, it had bees living in it. And this beauty is um, a mastic tree that was, mastics are a native tree that were almost wiped out because of the desirability of their wood. This one was at Trunk Bay and we got where it comes down to the beach near the West End and there is not any sign of it. The, the sea came into the, uh, the gut there. Okay, brief, moving on to some animal <laughs> Another thing that's very sad, although they seem to have recovered and be recovering, the scaly naked pigeon uh, are large pigeons that were actually hunted a great deal for food up until the 1960s and were very scarce and then became quite common. Irma hit at the height of the fruiting season for most of our native trees in September and these pigeons are exclusively fruit eaters and they starved. They, uh, I had actually these pigeons drop, literally dropping out of the trees in my yard. <laughs> And uh, anytime I tried to put out food for them, the, the thrushes would get it first. <laughs> Oops. That was a weird transition. But the, our tire palms, our native palm, managed to get fruit out within a month after Irma. Those are their fruit clusters there at the base of the leaves, and that uh, saved the day for a lot. This picture, um, it's hard to see, I'm sure, but all of those yellow things are banana quits. <laughs> and they're, they're recovering pretty well, mostly because people put out sugar for them. I started putting sugar somewhat inadvertently because I keep my sugar in the freezer and I had to, of course, empty my refrigerator and freezer within a few days. And um, it was so popular that I started buying sugar by the end of September, I was buying two pounds of sugar a day, and the banana quits, <laughs> banana quits would, I would drive in my driveway and park with the windows open, and banana quits would land on my steering wheel. <laughs> Did you bring it? Did you bring it? <laughs> like a lot of them. But then, amazingly enough, in November, it was as if the switch was turned. Something must have come back into bloom and um, within a three or four day period. I, I was feeding, I estimated 175 of them every day. And within a three or four day period, they all just left. They were gone. So that went back to normal. If anyone was here in the fall, you may remember these guys. <laughs> They were the most horrible things imaginable, particularly living as I do without, uh, without screens on the windows. They are fungus gnats, and they, are, they were extremely attracted to light at night, and they, um, 
They would come in as soon as it got dark and you had any kind of, of course for, for me it was kerosene lights or battery powered lights and um, they came by the millions. I had to stop cooking dinner at night. I would cook dinner before it got dark because otherwise the amount of added protein was <laughs> But they, they feed on rotting vegetation. So they had, they had their, the best bonanza ever in their history. And usually there be, they may be around in very small numbers, but uh, you probably wouldn't even notice they were there because they're tiny. But this was, this was around one lantern in the morning when I was cleaning up. <laughs> These guys. Jack Spaniards are very common wasps, were, like the leaves on the trees, apparently totally wiped out for the time being. I still haven't seen one since about four, four days after the hurricane. They, that first week they were coming in the houses and just flying around in a day's fashion. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be back in numbers with time, but it was it's just interesting how totally they were gone. So then we get to the caterpillars. These are caterpillar eggs. They're um, eggs of the white butterfly that's called a great southern white, which is, seems like a misnomer because they're actually rather small. <laughs> but they certainly occur in numbers. And I actually was, I wasn't sure if we would see a butterfly explosion now. I tend to think of them as tied to droughts here. But um, after, the, after Maryland, we had a butterfly ex explosion, but Maryland actually ended a very severe drought when it happened. And then we also had a butterfly explosion in 2015, but this one is <laughs> the equal of any of them. This is what it, um, it hatches into, and there are clouds of them out there for a while. Now I had a big scare in March, and this, this is a caterpillar eating the leaves of a gardenia on my porch. I got up one morning and discovered I had a red caterpillar that was eating absolutely everything in sight. Most caterpillars will only eat one or two, possibly, or related plants. But this caterpillar ate palms, orchids, bromeliads, gardenias, <laughs> buttonwoods. <laughs> and um, I said, this, is really, this really isn't going to work right now. Actually, I found all of them and squished them by hand. <laughs> so, and they're probably something super rare. And I, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I, I'm a plant person. But um, we've had outbreaks of two caterpillars that are very host specific. This is a flamboyant tree, <laughs> poor thing. The flamboyant caterpillars actually have been around here since at least the 1980s. They're inchworm type caterpillars. They hang down on threads, and they came through and defoliated uh, almost all the flamboyant trees. And then turpentine caterpillars, which our poor turpentine trees have been through so much, but the turpentine caterpillars actually showed up for the first time three years ago. Uh, and probably, like that sea grape shoot borer, they probably came with imported plants from Florida. We have no control over what comes in here at all. Plants are supposed to be from certified nurseries, but nursery certification uh, means that somebody comes once a year and uh, doesn't see obvious <laughs> that everything's dying in your nursery. <laughs> um, I have a series that we're now moving on to the more hopeful things. I have, because somebody asked me actually to document the are uh, bay rum trees back right after the hurricane. I'm fortunate enough to have a large grove of them by my house. And this was, this picture was taken in uh, late September. They were still totally bare. And then late October. And what they look like now. <laughs> so, <laughs> And I try very hard, I miss, I miss my coconuts, I may speak out against planting large numbers of them back on beaches, but I loved my coconut trees very much.
but I'm looking on the bright side. I now have a big sky. Uh, <laughs> here, but here is a coconut just starting to come back. There was one of the few that I was sure was going to make it, but it was a little much ago. This was November already. Um, but now it's like that. And now I had, we had rainbows every single morning. For months and months, we had through all of October, November, December, January, we had rainbows. And that went on Carbell Rock um, another morning and then now I also have really great sunsets and, <laughs> and our trees, I guess the take home message is our native forests are going to be able to deal with it, but we really need to be vigilant about, particularly about introduced pests. Um, and it might, I don't know exactly, if it might be time for our national park to lobby. It is federal people, USDA, who uh, would be checking our borders. I think we really, really need to have much, much more stringent rules about what is imported into these islands because we do not have agriculture as a significant part of our economy. Our government, Virgin Islands government has um, turned a totally blind eye over the years and it seemed like it's more important for people to be making money selling imported plants. This actually just started, the imported plant tank started with the rental villa tourism basis, which you know, really started in the 1990s, and it's, uh, it could have really devastating consequences when combined with it. We also do need, and I know this is not always a popular thing, we really need to be monitoring and, if necessary, controlling our populations of introduced grazing animals, including white-tailed deer, because you know, we lose our mangroves, we lose, you know, for forever. <laughs> We're in big, bigger trouble than we are. And there are a lot of other things that they have been, you know, just been destroying. The deer population was almost imperceptible until after Hurricane Maryland in the late 1990s. And um, it's, you know, it has its ups and downs, but, um, it is, we do have, along with the fact that our trees grow very well, um, we, most of you who know me you know I'm on my soapbox here, but we have, our forests are the best low elevation dry forests in the Caribbean. They are diverse, full of native plants. They're not always you know, as showy as other things. They've been heavily affected by 300 years of various types of agriculture and more recently other development. But almost everything on our hillsides is native and a lot of it is unique to the Eastern Caribbean and it's, it's valuable. And we may have no idea what, how things really fit together and whether if one particular species disappears, what other species that depends on that disappears and the cascade effect that, that happens. So, uh, St. John overall, I think, you know, we're, we're going to come out of this with time. Uh, some, of, some of the forests on west facing slopes up high are going to take probably at least 30 or 40 years before they're anything like what they were before the hurricane. But, uh, but we really need to stay on top of it as much as